You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. So data sovereignty, right, is this concept that, you know, for a long time we thought of the digital world as a world without borders. And and actually what we're seeing now is national borders are starting to mean something again, even in the digital world. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Caveat, the CyberWire's privacy surveillance law and policy podcast. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me is my co-host, Ben Yellen, from the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security. Hi, Ben. Hello, Dave. Today, Ben has the story of a raid on an independent journalist who leaked unaired clips from Fox News. I've got the story of a D.C. court ruling that AI-generated content is not eligible for copyright protection. And later in the show, my conversation with George Zihanis of Archive 360. We're talking about what happens when information could be housed anywhere in the world. While this show covers legal topics and Ben is a lawyer, the views expressed do not constitute legal advice. For official legal advice on any of the topics we cover, please contact your attorney. Tired of cybersecurity mega conferences, MWISE is different. With a focused agenda and targeted problem solving, MWISE is where security's best go to get better. From September 18th through the 20th in Washington, D.C., you'll join a special community of security's sharpest minds. Hear perspectives you might not get anywhere else and reach a new level of mastery that'll prepare you for what's next. Register early and save at mwise.mandiant.com slash conf23. That's mwise.mandiant.com forward slash conf23. All right, Ben, let's dig into our stories here. Why don't you kick things off for us? So my story is everything. Uh, It comes from the (laughs) substack of journalist Kim Zetter, who is one of the top journalists in the field of cybersecurity, national security. Yeah. Um, We certainly have learned a lot from her work over the years. Sure. And I was actually alerted to the story on LinkedIn. I've had people, fans of the show, perhaps, start just tagging me on these types of stories. Nice. (laughs) So please continue to do that. Uh, It, it, you know, makes it so that it's less work for me to find articles. So thanks, everybody, for that. Uh, So this is about a guy named Tim Burke who got in trouble uh, with Florida law enforcement because he leaked unaired clips of Fox News, specifically the Tucker Carlson show. So Tucker Hmm. Carlson, of course, no longer with Fox News, but the relevant material was leaked in 2022. Okay. Basically, what happened is Tucker Carlson did an interview with Ye, the artist previously known as Kanye West. Okay. uh, And he presented the interview as this guy is a normal guy. He deserves to be listened to. Uh, But it turns out there are a bunch of unaired clips that didn't make it into the segment where Ye is acting like a maniac and saying (laughs) things that are wild and anti-Semitic. Oh. Uh, So somehow, when we'll get into this, uh, this journalist, Tim Burke, got access to these unaired portions and leaked them to Vice News. Vice News published them. Mm -hmm. uh, And Florida law enforcement started an investigation into Burke for violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the anti-hacking statute. Hmm. Uh, And they raided Tim Burke's home and took a bunch of his equipment. So it was one of those middle-of-the-night raids. They obtained a warrant to do it, accusing him of violating uh, the CFAA. Uh, And now Tim Burke is going to try to suppress that evidence Um, when and if he goes to trial. He has not been charged. This is simply uh, a search that was done in suspicion of criminal activity. Hmm. So a little background on Tim Burke. First of all, I think it's relevant. He he actually wasn't working at a major publication uh, when the story took place. He wasn't really working at any publication. So there's kind of the question, if we have special federal protections for journalists where there's kind of a heightened standard for targeting journalists. Was he a journalist in these circumstances? Mm. I think he argues, and other digital rights advocates have argued persuasively, that of course he's a journalist. Anybody who's doing this type of investigative work and who is making news uh, by talking to sources, et cetera, whether they're working for an actual publication, they are a journalist Mm -hmm. and they deserve those protections. Right. Um, Tim Burke was actually the guy who co-wrote the um, story. This is more than 10 years ago now on Monty Teo, the football player's uh, alleged fake girlfriend, Hmm. um, which was like one of the most 
crazy, interesting, wild uh, pieces of journalism I've probably seen in my lifetime. Uh, so this he's a very like my my girlfriend lives in Canada kind of story. Or yeah, I mean I'm not familiar with it. <laughs> Basically, there was there was this. Uh, yeah, I mean, we can uh, go on a little tangent here because it's so interesting. <laughs> Quickly, but basically, yeah. this guy um, had claimed that his grandmother and his girlfriend had died within the same football season. It became a national story. Oh, his grandmother actually had died. The girlfriend was fake. Um, oh, I see. I, I think what Monty Teo argues is that he never realized the girlfriend was fake. I think he improperly claimed that he had met her, but there was this other guy who was obsessed with this football player who pretended to be a woman and used like a stock photo online. Oh, right. This is coming back to me now. I do. Yeah. Yeah. I have a vague recollection of this. So, yeah, yeah I mean, this is something that Tim Burke had did in a past life, meaning he is a, a pretty darn good journalist. Right. So let's talk about the computer fraud and abuse act segment here. Cause fun as it is to reminisce about Monty Teo, I think there's an important legal story here. Right. The question is whether Burke violated the CFAA. And if you remember from the Van Buren case that we've talked about, exceeding authorized access requires you to be somewhere where you're not allowed to be. It is this gate up, gate down approach. If you mm-hmm. breach that gate, that's a violation of the statute. Mm-hmm. Burke says he doesn't remember how he obtained the information uh, that he ended up sending to Vice News. I don't know if I believe that entirely, yeah. but um, that that is what he said. Okay. So... It turns out the uh, Kim Zetter did some investigative work based on court filings, and what appears to have happened is that somebody who provided news tips to Burke in the past found a username and password for a demo account on a website used by broadcasters called LiveU.TV. Hmm. So this website provides transmission services to TV and radio broadcasters and others so that they can send live feeds from uh, the field into production offices. Okay. So that used to kind of be done by satellite. This is a way so that you don't have to do it by satellite. Right. Burke found a publicly available username and password for a demo account. He found it, or his tipster found it, on a webpage belonging to a CBS radio affiliate in Tennessee. Again, this was posted publicly. Mm -hmm. So to me, there's no hacking here. There's no... Unauthorized access, there's no exceeding authorized access. Because it's a demo account. It's a demo account. Right. And he didn't he didn't hack anything to get that username and password to that demo account. It was publicly available on a website. This is journalism. Right. This is somebody searching the internet to find a, a resource, a source. Let me ask you this. So let me interrupt and sure. say if so suppose uh you know, you walk out of the studio here today and you inadvertently leave behind a scrap of paper that has your username and password for your email. If I log on to your email using that scrap of paper that you left behind, my understanding is that would be a violation of the, com- of the, uh, of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act because I am not authorized to access your uh, email account. That is correct. Now, yeah. there's a very important distinction, and this gets into the legalese here, which okay. I know is kind of annoying, but it's about <laughs> whether a reasonable person would think that that information was trying to – was uh, that somebody was trying to keep that information private. Okay. Uh, so you discovering my password, a reasonable person would believe that I was trying to conceal that, that it was an accident that I accidentally left in your office. Right. And so that would be a violation of the statute. Same thing of like in the physical world, if I leave my front door unlocked, that doesn't mean that someone can waltz into my house. Exactly, exactly. So we're using a reasonable person standard, meaning we have to look kind of objectively what would a reasonable person think under similar circumstances. Okay. If I saw a login to a demo account on a public website, you know, this is maybe a tough question. I wouldn't think that that website was trying to shut me out uh, no. from being able to access it. No, of course not. Especially because they are publishing demo accounts. Now, it's unclear why the CBS affiliate in Tennessee was posting a demo account login uh, information mm-hmm. for uh, the service, but they did, and there's no indication that LiveU.TV is trying to keep its feeds private. Mm-hmm. I just don't think that's necessarily a standard practice of theirs. They probably want people to have access to demo accounts so that people purchase their services. So I think that's very relevant here. And that's what distinguishes it from, oops, I left my password behind. You have access to it. You didn't break down the gate to that password. Mm -hmm. It's still a violation of the statute because a reasonable person would know, you know, it's a username and password. It's something I would want to keep uh, as private. 
Right. So the CFAA violation or potential violation was the entire reason uh, for this raid by law enforcement. Hmm. And even though Burke has not yet been charged with a crime, I think certainly you could argue that his civil liberties were violated. They confiscated a bunch of his recording equipment, yeah. um, all different types of stuff that he would need to practice journalism. Uh, and that is certainly violates the spirit of uh, the federal laws that protect journalists from these types of uh, First Amendment violations. So it's just a really interesting multi-layered story. Um, and I'm hoping that law enforcement, uh, whether they drop, whether they uh, decline to file charges or if this happens in court, that the Van Buren interpretation of the CFAA holds uh, and that this is this was not an uh, exceeding uh, an instance of exceeding authorized access and therefore Burke should not be punished under the law. We've had a couple of stories, you know, along this same vein recently. We had the the one with the the um, you know the small town newspaper that got raided. I don't know, last week or the week before. Yeah, I mean, we did that story last week. Um, yeah, that was really the hook here for Kim Zetter is everybody's paying attention to that story. This story out of Florida is, is quite similar. It's mm-hmm. still a law enforcement attack, uh, search and seizure of a journalist. What does it take to? tamp down on this? In other words, I presume law enforcement, well, I I guess what folks at Fox News probably complained to law enforcement, made their case. Uh, Law enforcement had to convince a judge for the raid, right? Right, They did. Um, Yeah. And Fox News sent a cease and desist to Vice and to another um, media resource who was planning to publish some of this material. So they got their legal department on top of it. Um, while their legal department was busy defending lawsuits from Dominion voting systems, they also had time to address this. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what does it take to, I mean, does it, it just, is it going to take the police getting their hands smacked? Could judges have to uh, demand more scrutiny? What step along the chain is going to have people take a closer look at this? Because it seems to me like right now the judges are going along with this It's certainly in these two cases without perhaps the scrutiny it deserves. So I only say this half jokingly. It's us yelling about it on a podcast. That is really what changed uh, the situation in Kansas where you had a prosecutor who I I think uh, went out over his skis to obtain this warrant who ended up revoking the warrant and returned the seized materials to the journalists of the uh, Marion County record, which we talked about last week. Right. I think the only reason that happened is there was a national outcry. Every media source in the country signed documents, letters saying that this was an egregious violation of the First Amendment, mm-hmm. um, that this threatened the rights of journalists. We had that terrible situation where um, the publisher, the 98-year-old woman who was a publisher of that paper, ended up dying, I think proximately because of this raid. And because of the national outcry, they revoked that warrant and returned the material to to that news source. And what Kim Zetter is saying here is that perhaps Florida prosecutors should do the same and return all of Burke's seized materials. Right. I think it, uh, it maybe it shouldn't take a public outcry, but I think if both prosecutors and judges at every level realize that people care a lot about journalism and the First Amendment and the right of journalists, reporters, et cetera, to not be threatened by the government uh pursuing illegal raids. I think once there's kind of a public awareness of that, that could really change behavior. Uh, So I think the public outcry is kind of the mechanism here, at least in the short term, of how we're going to hold these law enforcement officials, these judges accountable for unjust actions. To what degree do you suppose this is political? In other words, you know, this happened in Florida. Um, we know what the political leanings are in Florida. Um, certainly journalists have a lower standing uh, among people on the right than people on the left. Uh, and that's the reality that we live in, the, you know, the, the accusation of fake news and, and all that sort of stuff. I mean, ideally, we would think that uh, law enforcement and judges would be above that. But does that, does that at all come into play here? Does, does Kim Zetter address that or is that a... Is it a subtext here? What do you think? I think it is more subtext. There's no evidence that this was politically motivated. Okay. Um, 
I don't think Tim Burke himself is like, I mean, he's leaked to liberal websites. I don't get the impression that he himself is some kind of radical leftist. Right. um, Who's subjecting himself willingly or not to the watchful eyes of Florida law enforcement. Uh I think they got the complaint from Fox News and they investigated it. And I just think they had an incorrect interpretation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that they used uh, incorrectly and unjustly to obtain this warrant. Um, So... There certainly is a subtext. This is Florida. This was Fox News. Um, I don't know how much Fox News wants to uh, defend Tucker Carlson at this point, considering he's moved on. But um, that's neither here nor there. I think it is subtext and not um, something that's really out in the open, either in other stories about this or in Kim Zetter's piece on Substack. It's also interesting to me that they went after the journalist rather than the person or entity who originally posted this to the file sharing site. Like there seems to, was there any effort to find out who was responsible for that? I I mean, it certainly doesn't seem like it. Um, There's nothing in this piece that indicates that they went after anybody here except for Burke and the people who worked with him. Hmm. So yeah, I mean, we had multiple characters in the story. It wasn't just Burke who- Killed a messenger. Right, yeah. right. Uh, <laughs> he simply obtained this lo- this publicly available login information from a tipster that he had relied on in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, the tipster is anonymous, and Burke is someone who's not anonymous because I think he was associated with the publishing of these articles. I think both Vice News and the other outlets who used this material said this was the result of an investigation by Tim Burke. So I think law enforcement is going after the person they know is involved in the story rather than the people who they can't, don't have any proof have been involved in what happened here. Is this an example of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act being outdated and needing an update? Or is this an example of a good law being used in a bad way? I think it's more the latter. Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly was encouraged by the Van Buren case and by Justice Barrett's opinion on this, mm-hmm. which um, I think protects— the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act from being used to abuse journalists and others uh, by making it a crime to log into somebody else's Facebook account, for example. I mean, that was kind of the parade of horribles that Supreme Court justices were warning about Mm -hmm. when they narrowed the interpretation to this gate-up, gate-down approach. Did you have a right to be there in the first place? Mm. Uh, So I just think this was a misapplication of the law. Um, The way our legal system works is that if this ever were to come to trial— I think uh, a good attorney for Mr. Burke and the court would have to look at that Van Buren decision and realize that this certainly, this instance wasn't in the spirit of, of that decision. Yeah. Um, so I do think this is an example of just misapplying the relevant law. Certainly any changes to these types of statutes, we're talking about a computer fraud statute from the 1980s. <laughs> they could always use updating. Right. Uh, when you have a statute uh, that's as old as I am, you know that uh, it's it's getting old and gray and, and bigger and balder. So, uh, you know, you need to, you need to kind of update it to comply with modern times. But yeah. I think this is less of a story of the statute itself and more just a misapplication of it. Okay. Well, we will have a link to, uh, to this story in the show notes, and uh, I'll just reemphasize here that, uh, in my opinion, uh, anything that Kim Zetter writes is worth your time. In fact, uh, she's one of a handful of uh, newsletters that I pay to subscribe to because I, I really find her stuff uh, high value and, and definitely uh, worth checking out. So we'll have a link to that in the show notes. Uh, my story this week comes from Bloomberg Law. And uh, this is about a D.C. court ruling that says that AI-generated art lacks copyright protection, which I suppose, Ben, means it's in the public domain. Yeah, it is. (laughs) We can can use it. We can sell it. We can uh, make a fortune off this AI-generated art. You know, I have to say— AI-generated art has kind of impressed me so far. Mm-hmm. I'm following a Twitter account uh, that's based on, or an X account, if you will, um, <laughs> right. that is AI-based. It's somebody who puts Donald Trump in, like, famous historical photos, but oh. makes him look natural. So, like, here's Donald Trump, um, you know, with Moses during the exodus from Egypt. Right, right. It's it's pretty good. Like they've uh, AI has so it's done, subtle. It's very subtle. Exactly. Right. I'm not sure right. if this is somebody who's a fan of Donald Trump or just somebody who's trying to be funny. I find it humorous. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I've been kind of impressed with how good AI 
uh, generated art has been so far. And now we, at least according to this one district court judge in D.C., uh, it is in the public domain because at least to the extent that there's a body of law on this, we've never recognized that art not created by humans doesn't have copyright protections. Yeah. So this article points out that uh, this was Judge Beryl A. Howell uh, of the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia basically confirmed a U.S. Copyright Office decision that denied uh, a copyright registration to a bit of AI art that was uh, generated by a computer scientist, Stephen Thaler, who claimed that it was eligible, wanted to be eligible for copyright protection. Um, this is interesting uh, because there, it, it sort of um, pivots or, or centers on this notion that something that can be copyrighted has to have a human involved in making it. And what what made me laugh about this is that they denied copyright uh, recent. One of the cases they cited was one where they denied copyright to a monkey who took a selfie. <laughs> if you remember that one. It's so funny. <laughs> so many of the precedent cases they use for AI have to do with animals. Right. Because it's like, I think the analogy is that it's this non-sentient being who isn't aware of its own existence. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's the similarity between animals and AI. You know, what's kind of funny about this is I think um, the guy who brought this lawsuit, Thaler or Thaler, yeah. uh, <laughs> I think he was kind of trying to make a point here. He admitted in all the filings that he played no creative role in uh, coming up with these images. He didn't paint it. Right. He didn't design it. Um, he might have decided what the inputs were, but it's not his, it, it isn't his work of art. And I think we have to keep a watchful eye for future cases where that isn't clear. Maybe an artist designed something and incorporated AI um, to augment that design or right. to put it in a certain style. I think that's where it's going to get complicated and where you're going to have a new body of case law under the Federal Copyright Act. But yeah. I think this case was just not the one where it was going to happen because you have a plaintiff who's admitting. Uh, I'm thinking of that online meme with that old guy saying he admitted. <laughs> I just I, I think he's just admitting here that um, – he played no role in the creation of, of this work. Yeah. They do point out that um, uh, earlier this year, the Copyright Office did grant a uh, limited copyright registration for an AI-assisted graphic novel, which I think is interesting because it seems inevitable to me that where this is going to go is at some point it's going to be a matter of degrees, right? right? Like if I have an AI-generated background in my piece of art, and I paste a smiley face in the middle of it, is that now copyrightable? Because yeah. I Your added creation the smiley was the face. smiley face. Right, right. Yeah, I think it's going to become a line drawing exercise. And maybe we're going to get some legal standard where it's like whether a reasonable person would think that this is created by a human being or through artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. I don't know exactly what that standard is going to be, but I think you're right that we are going to have to draw the line somewhere. Maybe it's going to be was the majority of that artwork designed by a human being. <laughs> right, more than de- 49%. <laughs> yeah, and like how are you going to get a jury to determine that or a judge to determine that? It's it's really murky. I mean, yeah. I just think this is such a new area of the law that we don't really have a reliable body of law to draw from here. Certainly, Congress or state legislatures could get involved. I'm not holding my breath as it comes to Congress. Right. Um, but state legislatures could define what counts as AI-generated material for copyright pur- uh, purposes. That would be the best way to do this is to kind of develop some positive law around this. But until then, I mean, I think judges are just going to have to um, kind of do some guesswork and, and figure out, is this actually a creative work done by a human being? Mm-hmm. Or is this the equivalent of a monkey taking a selfie? Um, <laughs> so I have a couple of questions here, a couple yeah. of scenarios. So could I copyright the prompt that I use to generate the AI image? See, I think you'd have a much better case doing that because that's your creation. The right. art itself isn't your creation, but presumably you developed that prompt. You developed the input. So yes. I think you might have a copyright interest in that. Okay. I'm trying to think of what like a metaphor for that would be in the physical world. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you putting in some type of music software, play these, these chords, these piano chords. Right. You still would have been the creative genius behind it, not Mm -hmm. the system that ended up spitting out those chords. So Mm -hmm. 
I think perhaps you would have a copyright interest in it. Well, that leads perfectly into my next question, which is, what about kind of the inverse of this? So my son has been sending me AI-created songs that are sung in the voice of Frank Sinatra, okay? So someone took Frank Sinatra's voice and they trained an AI on it, and they've been having this AI-generated voice of Frank Sinatra sing popular songs, right? Songs that came out way after Frank Sinatra passed away. Frank Sinatra singing Beyonce or something. Exactly, exactly. So could the fact that these are AI created protect from copyright holders coming or the, uh, um, the, the descendants of Frank Sinatra who want to protect his interest, right? Could the fact that it's AI created protect someone from people coming after them. Yeah, I mean, it kind of blows your mind a little bit, does it? Because you have two creative works here. You have the song itself that they're drawing off of, which certainly there are copyright protections attached to that. I don't think there's any question there. Uh, And then you have the voice. Frank Sinatra's voice is a very distinct, specific thing. Yeah. Uh, So I'm not sure, especially if you were to be making money and selling this music based off his voice, then I think you're using his creative outlet, his voice, which to me seems like it also would be a copyright violation. Mm. Um, So again, we don't have any sort of guiding law on this because it's so new, Mm -hmm. but my instinct would be that there are kind of two sets of copyright protections at play there, Hmm. the the drafter of the original song and then the voice itself. Couldn't I say it's parody? If it were parody, you could say it's parody. <laughs> right. But, but I mean, couldn't I just say that the, 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 the notion of Frank Sinatra singing a Beyonce song is uh, so absurd as to be parody? Yeah, I mean, that would probably be your best argument in that circumstance. Yeah. It would be like kind of what Weird Al does. Right, right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and, and in that sense, maybe it would be protected. But mm-hmm. let's say you were genuinely trying to— have Frank Sinatra sing Beyonce songs because you thought it was beautiful and you tried to produce an album based on that, then I think you'd run into copyright problems. Even though it was AI generated, you're using, in my mind, two copyrighted works, the song itself and Frank Sinatra's beautiful New York voice. But does copyright cover the sound of someone's voice? I mean, I... If I'm a Frank Sinatra impersonator... How good can I be before I get in trouble? Yeah, I mean, what's different about AI is it's trained on his actual voice, so it's not somebody right. imitating it. But uh, So I'd be trained on his actual voice. Yeah, I mean, you raise, <laughs> <laughs> you raise a good point here. But like, yeah, right? and this gets into the metaphysical. Is, <laughs> right. it, is it really his voice? I mean, it's trained on his voice. Mm-hmm. There's no other human being trying to imitate it. Right. It might be saying that the artificial intelligence might have Frank Sinatra saying words that he actually said in the voice that he actually said them. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you're, I think you're getting beyond my capability for being Come able on. to Come adjudicate on, that dispute. Yeah. <laughs> That's where I just throw my hands up and say, uh, right. Right. Let's, let, let's let the jury decide. I'm going to go, yeah. you know, I'm going to exactly. go take a long lunch it's break. It's undetermined. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it really points to the fact that these are interesting times and these are unanswered questions that we're going to have to address. There are going to be so many test uh, test cases because eventually someone's going to try and make money off of this. Like, right, right. That's I where the rubber have, hits the road. Yeah, I have Frank Sinatra <laughs> doing the full Taylor Swift Eras Tour set list. Yeah. And I'm going to sell it on the Apple Music Store for whatever, twelve ninety nine. Right. Then I think you're going to run into many copyright problems. And what uh, if I say it's this this AI voice that I've created, and his name is Hank Benatra? Right. Uh, <laughs> so is that <laughs> right. is that kind of the Weird Al track, or is that right. you're ripping off two copyrighted works? I I just don't know. Yeah. I really don't know. All right. Well, I know I, it's not a satisfying answer. No, but. it's not. But it's fascinating to think about. Right. And, the, you know, yeah, we're this is what we're in for. This is what we're going to see. This this genie is not going back in the bottle. No, it certainly is not. And, you know, if you want to be the test case, I encourage you to create that music. Um, <laughs> we might be saying your name on this podcast because your name is going to be uh, attached to a test case. Here. Right. All so, the way to the Supreme Court. <laughs> exactly. So have fun with that. Yeah. All right. Well, we will have a link to that story again. That's from Bloomberg Law. We'll have a link to that in the show notes.
And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. Ben, I recently had the pleasure of speaking with George Zahanis. He's from an organization called Archive 360. And we're talking about um, where your data is stored uh, and the degree to which that matters. It, really a fascinating topic. Here's my conversation with George Zahanis. So data sovereignty, right, is this concept that, you know, for a long time we thought of the digital world as a world without borders. And, and actually what we're seeing now is national borders are starting to mean something again, even in the digital world. Probably started, um, you could, if you had to put a point on it, um, when the U.S. passed the Cloud Act, which codified uh, something that was happening um, in the court system here in the U.S., where um, the DOJ was trying to compel Microsoft, in that case, to produce information on a foreign national where the data was held in a foreign data center, but under the custody or control of, of Microsoft. And that was working its way through the court system when the, the U.S. basically uh, said that, yeah, the U.S. can compel anybody who has custody or control of information, even if it's in a foreign jurisdiction, to provide it back to the DOJ. And that was pretty much enough for a whole bunch of countries globally to think about sovereignty of their data. So given that, where do we find ourselves with different nations approaching this? Right. And, and so one of the ways I've, I've tried to explain this and, and when we work with our customers is think about it not from a national security perspective anymore, but a national interest perspective. So this isn't really just focused on highly secret national security related information. We're talking about things really around the national interest. So maybe uh, information and, and systems that are associated with an infrastructure, energy sector, the financial services sector or the privacy associated uh, with the citizens of that nation state. You see this happening across Europe. You see this in uh, countries like Germany and, and France. You see this happening in the Middle East. So the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Dubai. Um, you see this obviously in, in, uh, in Asia and China. And here in the U.S., a broader introduction of a concept called confidential unclassified information has been introduced by the U.S. government as well. And what does that mean? Can you define that term for us? Right. So all of these states that are introducing some concept around the sovereignty of data are establishing a scheme, a data classification scheme that says this series of information and this classification of information is subject to some sort of either restriction around national boundaries or how that information has to be protected and secured within, within a set of systems. And so... These, again, are fairly broad classes of information that could pertain to designs of infrastructure. They could pertain to the critical market and financial services related information that's moving. Um, this could be data that pertains to government programs, that it's not classified, but still is something that the U.S. wants to make sure and these other jurisdictions want to make sure are protected. Now, what about for cloud providers or, or for folks who provide backup services? You know, I, I could see the benefit of having your data distributed, not just different 
data centers around a nation, but around the world. Does this come into conflict with their needs? It, it does, and it's it's actually very interesting uh, because the some of these laws are taking the form now, not just, and this is why I say look at it from a national interest perspective and not just a security perspective. Mm-hmm. A number of these countries are taking the position that not only does that information have to stay within the borders of that that jurisdiction, but that the custody and control of this information must be managed by not managed within that country and by nationals of that country. France has done this and Germany has done this. So in France, they're proposing uh, that no entity with a foreign ownership structure, basically, or with foreign actors can really manage these environments for about 600 uh, companies. France has effectively established a a government approved cloud for this types of this type of information that would be managed uh, by T systems, uh, which is is a a part obviously of uh, a German company. If you look at how the Middle East is trying to deal with this, those states might not be large enough on their own to justify a cloud provider to come in. So they're investing and basically giving the cloud providers an investment to come and provide these great services and these great technologies in country. But again, that's a way for them to make sure that that information stays in country with a level of control because they're they're making these investments and, and having effectively a joint venture. Yeah, I think that notion of national interest versus national security is really uh, fascinating and, and uh, you know, a really sharp uh, observation. I, I, I think that's a really interesting way to look at things. It's a great insight. Thanks. I, so for organizations who are concerned with this, I mean, what sort of questions should you be asking your providers? Well, I think the first thing you really want to, start asking yourself, um, right, as a customer is, you know, what if any of this is subject to, uh, what if any of the information that I'm working with is potentially subject to a data sovereignty requirement, right? Or if here if in the U.S., if you're working for the U.S. government or you're a contractor with the U.S. government, what types of information might be subject to this, this CUI classification? And that's the first step, right? Because you kind of have to understand that. Then the second piece is, if I'm using cloud providers, do I have an option to put certain classes of information in different jurisdictions? Now, many of the large cloud providers have already started to do this, and they were doing this even before you know some of the some of this became a, a real hot topic. You know, so the large cloud providers have instances of cloud in in many of these different jurisdictions, and because of what we see uh, around data sovereignty. There are more of those in-country, if you will, or in-region deployments going on. So your service providers uh, and your cloud providers, you need to make sure that they you're able to take that application, that workload, whatever it is, and, and get it into the right data center, if you will, from, from those cloud providers and make sure that that's happening. Does encryption come into play here at all? I mean, does it make a difference, you know... Is it okay to store something in, in another nation if we presume they're not going to be able to access it? So far, that doesn't appear to be the case. Um, there's there's one interesting, though, way to, to look at this as well, which is, you know, if you are a company and you are concerned about this uh, and you're concerned about the long arm of, of foreign jurisdiction, the long arm of the U.S., the long arm of some other country, Encryption is actually an important piece of this because if you as a customer can maintain the keys on the encryption and the cloud provider or the service provider do not have the keys to that data, it's almost irrelevant if that cloud provider gets a uh, a subpoena or a regulatory request to provide that data in the sense that they can't provide it in a form that's going to be useful without going to the customer who's maintaining the keys. That's a really important attribute of how you really should be thinking about structuring data or your, you know, structuring your, your management of this data uh, and gives the customer control to at least know if a country is coming after that data. Where do you suppose we're headed here? You know, we, we have uh 
I hear folks on, on the policy side talk about this notion of a splinter net, you know, that we're going to see more and more nations putting up sort of virtual walls around themselves out of their own interest. What does the future hold here, do you suppose? Yeah, I, I've written an article um, several months ago on this, and I, I used the analogy of the digital iron curtain, right? So mm. it's it's descending kind of around countries. Obviously, it's not like a, an east block versus west block, but that, that's what we're we're definitely seeing. I suspect because, again, if you view this in the context of national interest, I suspect that it's it is going to continue. How far it goes, I'm not sure. But there's definitely going to be some form of digital curtain, if you will, around a lot of countries and a lot of workloads. Ben, what do you think? I love it. was a really interesting conversation. I love this notion of data sovereignty that it's not national security necessarily, but it's just in the national interest to protect our own data sovereignty. I think we've seen that reflected, maybe it's not national sovereignty, but with the European Union trying to protect their data from the U.S. surveillance state. And that's been the cause for the Schrems cases uh, and the need to keep renegotiating these data sharing agreements. Uh, so that's where our surveillance laws really come into play in a, in a really fascinating way. Yeah. All right. Well, again, our thanks to George Zahanis from Archive 360 for joining us. We do appreciate him taking the time. There's nothing worse than relying on a legacy SIM that your security team has outgrown, especially when it impacts your ability to detect real incidents. Hunter's SOC platform offers built-in, always up-to-date detection rules and automatic correlation that allows SOC analysts to focus on higher-value tasks that impact your organization. It's time to move to a platform that reduces risk, complexity, and cost for the SOC. It's time to replace your SIM. Learn more by visiting hunters.security today. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. Our senior producer is Jennifer Iben. This show is edited by Trey Hester. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Ben Yellen. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.